Now let's take a look at the implementation of barriers. Like locks, they can be implemented in different ways depending upon how important efficiency is. The performance criteria that we're going to be using are latency, which measures the time from when a threat arrives at a barrier until it gets to leave it. And then also the traffic, which is basically network traffic, the amount of traffic that's sent over the bus or network in order to have threads proceed past the barrier. So if there's lots of invalidations, then there's a lot of traffic because all of it, it has, to go, has to go over the bus or the network, and blocks once invalidated need to be refetched. Current systems typically use software to implement barriers, and this will work up to a point. We're going to talk about one solution that uses software and then sketch out how hardware might be used to design a more scalable solution. In either case, we have threads using a barrier in this way. They execute in parallel for a while, and then all of the threads need to reach the barrier before any proceed. Once they proceed past the barrier, they go through another parallel region and then hit a barrier. Very frequently, this, is, uh, this code is arranged in the form of a loop, so there's a barrier at the end of the loop, and that's like we saw in our Ocean application. Barriers are usually constructed using locks, so we could use any of the lock implementations in the previous lecture. So locks are kind of one of the low-level facilities used to construct barriers, just like locks were themselves constructed on top of low-level hardware instructions. Let's look at a simple way to implement a barrier. We start out by declaring three shared variables and initializing them all to zero. The first one is num arrived, which records the number of threads that have so far arrived at the barrier. The second one is a lock variable, which we'll call bar lock for barrier lock. And the third is a variable that tells whether threads are able to proceed past the barrier, and that's initialized to zero, which means that they can't yet pass the barrier. Then we get into the barrier method itself and we lock the lock because we have to increment num arrived in a critical section. We check to see whether num arrived equals zero, and if it does, then we set that can go flag to zero. The reason we have to reset it, because we, you know, we just initialized it, but we have to reset it because can go is going to become one at the end of the barrier, and so when we reach the barrier again, we need to set it back to zero so the threads can't leave immediately upon arrival at the barrier. They have to wait for can go to change back to one. And then we increment num arrived. Then we set a local variable called my count, which is equal to num arrived. So each thread has a different count here that will determine whether it's the last thread or not. That's the, really the only thing we use the count for. In the very next, we, we unlock the lock, and in the very next statement, we check whether my count is less than num threads. If it is less than num threads, then it has to wait. Can go changing away from zero. As long as can go is equal to zero, it sits in the while loop. But if my count equals the number of threads, well then this is the last thread to arrive, and it can set num arrived back to zero, which it needs to do to reinitialize for the next time through the loop. But perhaps more importantly, it also sets can go equal to one, which allows all other threads to proceed past their while loop and then exit the barrier. So it sounds pretty simple, but there's something wrong with it. And it's a race condition. Think about what it might be. The problem is with the can go variable. It's set to 1 to release all threads, but suppose all the threads don't leave the barrier in time. Let's say maybe one of them is suspended because it, uh, it was interrupted by a higher priority process on the processor it was running on. So before it can get away from the barrier, one of the other threads, and you know there could be lots of other threads, but only one of them needs to be fast enough to do this, gets all the way around, and arrives at the barrier again, or actually arrives at any barrier again if they're all coded this way, and then sets can go back equal to zero. Well, at this point, when that latent thread finally wakes up, it's going to find that can go equal zero again, and it's never going to get past the barrier. It's going to be stuck there until all the threads get around again. In fact, it probably will never get away because now we're down one thread in the count, and so my count will never reach num threads, and we've probably got deadlock. So this is not a very good implementation. One fix that might come to mind is just putting another 
barrier down here that all threads need to await. And so nobody can get past this point right down here until all the threads have awakened. You'd need another counter for that and another while loop. But you could do that. The only problem with that is now you've got two barriers and you've lengthened the amount of time in the barrier and there's a better way to do it. What we're going to look at now is called a sense reversal centralized barrier. And instead of having the threads awaiting can go equal to one each time, we just toggle it. The first time they wait for it to become one, the next time they wait for it to become zero, and then on alternating rivals at the barrier they wait for it to become one and zero. The code looks like this, and the only difference between the code here and the code we saw before is the code in black. Everything that's the same as it was before is in green. So you see that we have a thread private variable called value to await. So they set value to await equal to 1 minus value to await. First time it's 0, and so the, it gets initialized to 0, so the first time it's going to be set to 1 minus 0, which just means that it's going to be 1, the value that's being awaited. And then here, instead of the test being can go equal equal 0, it's can go not equal to value to await. So until the uh, can go variable gets changed to 1, this thread is stuck just like it was before in the other in the other implementation. But now down at the bottom, after we set num arrived equal to zero, we set can go equal to value to await rather than simply setting it to one. The first time through the barrier, this does have the effect of setting it equal to one, and then all the threads can proceed. But now if we have the scenario where one of the threads just get stuck here for a while until it, the process gets awakened. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen because the next time through value to await is going to be set to 1 minus value to await. In other words the threads are going to be awaiting it becoming 0 and if can go is set to that process's value to await, value to await on the last last iteration of the barrier or the last arrival at the barrier was 1 so it's going to be set equal to 1 and that's not the value that to await. And so if this thread manages to come down and get to value to await, it's still going to be waiting until the last thread arrives at this location. It sets can go equal to value to await, which is now 1. Now I've got a couple of questions for you on how the traffic scales at this barrier.